Father in heaven, we love you and thank you for the victory that you have won on our behalf, that you, you've, you've fought the fight and, and you've done the deed. And Lord, we get the rest and the reality that we're saved because of all that you've done. And so God, we just lift you up. We exalt you. We exalt your name. We magnify you. We, Lord, you're worthy of our worship and our praise and our adoration. And I pray. God, that as we ruminate on your word today and, and dig into to your scriptures, that you would reveal to us more about your nature and in, and in who we are in light of that. And uh, Lord, instruct us and give us wisdom. Um, Lord, we, we, op- we surrender to you. We open our hearts to you in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. How's everybody doing, church? Y'all feeling good? I'm going to jump right in real fast. If you have your Bibles, hit up Song of Solomon. It's somewhere in the middle of the Old Testament. And uh, if you don't have your Bible with you, we're going to uh, put, put the lyrics on the screen. It's literally lyrics of a song uh, written 3,000 years ago. And if you've been with us over the past uh, few weeks, we've been exploring this relationship between Solomon, potentially Solomon, or maybe this is just a song written about an ideal relationship. Uh, and it was written by Solomon or by one of Solomon's writers. We don't fully know, uh, but we see this picture of an ideal couple and how their love relationship unfolds over time. Uh, We see them dating. We see them getting engaged. We saw them get married, and we talked about marriage last week. And then today is probably the most awkward chapter in the entire Bible. So if you have your children with you in the room, fifth grade or younger, I would recommend that you hurry up and get them out of here or else... They're going to find out how they got here. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at the uh, marital union, the sacred, holy consummation of this marriage in chapter 4. We're going to see them on their honeymoon night. And then we're going to fast forward two chapters, and I'm actually going to preach chapter 4 and chapter 7. See, my man's got it right. He's like, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So we got chapter 4, and then we got chapter 7, two pretty redundant chapters in the Bible. But chapter 4 is their honeymoon night. Chapter 7 is like after they got into a big fight and they had makeup sex, all right? That's Bill's words around it, but they don't say that, but that's what I'm reading into it. Because chapters 5 and 6 are like this big argument. We're going to get to the argument next week. But because chapter 4 and 7 are kind of redundant, I thought I would combine the two for today so that you don't have to sit through two of these types of sermons a couple of weeks back to back, okay? So we're just going to combine both chapters into one. So I need you to read fast with me, and I'm going to hustle through, uh, through the text today. This is by far the two of the most erotic, passionate, wild chapters that you'll ever read in the Bible. In fact, some of you today are going to have to like check and be like, is this really a Bible? This really is a Bible that I'm reading right now because it is, it is amazing. So um, quickly too, I want to say this just as a matter of preface, okay? Uh, a lot of times when you read the Bible, you see two different things. You see prescription and you see description in the Bible. Prescription is when the Bible tells you what to do. The Bible is like, you got to do this. These are some rules to live by or some ways to behave, some things not to do, some things to do. That's prescriptive text. And then often when you read in the Bible, you see descriptive text, which is kind of like just a description of what happened. It's not God affirming it or saying that it's okay or saying that you should do it also. So a lot of times when you're reading the Bible, you have to determine between the two. And for today, I want you to know this. Today, we're reading a descriptive text. This is not prescriptive. Okay, so I don't want anyone to come out of today's teaching and go, wow, Bill told me I have to do these things. No, you don't have to do any of these things. Okay? And, um, uh, and, and, and so I want you to remember that this is like a goal that we strive for in our marriage, but it's not a rule that we live by. Because some of the things you're going to see in this passage um, – will make you a bit uncomfortable. You're like, I don't, and it takes a a while to get to that place in your marriage where you have this type of sacred, holy union. And we we named the series Sacred Romance for this purpose because sex is way more than a physical act. It is sacred. And and so we're going to learn a lot from this couple and from how they make one another feel and the way they, they set out to serve one another in their marriage. And part of serving each other is, is sexual. So marriage is two things. Marriage is a covenant and consummation. It's both of those things together. Okay? If you engaged in the covenant but didn't consume it, then I would be like questioning whether or not you're serious about the covenant. And, and every great marriage is 
is not made up of just great sex, but there is great sex, a part of every great marriage, with the exceptions of medical things, you just had a baby, other issues, whatever things arise that you, you selflessly serve one another and you find a way to, to still maintain intimacy and love for each other. But I've, it's very rare to find a, a great healthy marriage that doesn't have in, an, a great sex life. It's, it's very rare to find that. But great sex doesn't make for a great marriage, okay? And so we want, we want both. We want to, to serve one another in a way and be generous toward one another in these ways. So what, what I want to do real quick is reference um, some scientific data that will help you uh, process through some of these different things we're going to read. So um, it, it sounds like a generality when people say it, but it really is scientifically backed truth. Uh, there's a study that I've read from Emory University out of Atlanta uh, that, that kind of gave some, some outline to this, but there's multiple other like documentation out there that shows this reality that men are more visual than women, okay? And when, whenever they say that, they're not saying that women aren't visual. That's not what they're saying. What they're trying to, to say is that the, the things that happen in a man's brain when he sees sexual imagery is different than what happens in the average woman's brain when she sees sexual imagery. Just the visual side of it. That men are more visual, women are more audio or, or, or verbal in the way they receive uh, and think as it relates to sex. So men are good with just the image and that, that really gets them riled up. And women want context and like story and understanding what's going on and stuff. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of study to kind of back this. Now, some women are visual. Okay, some of the research I, s- I read said 75% of men are like high visual. And then 25% of men are medium to low visual. 25% of women are high visual. So some of you women in here, you're like, I'm high visual, so how dare you say that men are visual or I'm not? Well, you're one of the few women who are high visual that the majority of women are low to medium visual, okay? And then the same is true with men as it relates to verbal and auditory things as well. But for in general, scientific research shows that men are more visual and women are more audio or verbal. And we're going to see that play out in this text. We're going to see a, a man who is very generous with his words, He's going to pay her some compliments that build her confidence. And it's not just general compliments. He's going to get very specific. Okay? And then she's also going to, because he serves her in that way, verbally, she's going to respond to him and be very generous visually. Okay? And we get to be a fly on the wall in the bedroom chamber of these people. And for some of you, it's going to be very inspiring. You're going to, you're going to like... You're going to leave this place, and you're going to go ahead and book the hotel room, okay? And we're going to have more kids in the nursery in nine months as a result of today. <laughs> Others of you are going to be distraught, like highly offended, because what you see in the Scripture just doesn't line up with what you experience in your life. And what we're looking for here isn't a standard to live by that I want anyone to leave here feeling like, man, I just suck, you know, I'm just not good enough. I don't want anybody to feel that way. Uh, but we're looking at an ideal situation here. And not all of us have ideal lives. And so where the ideal is not realized, grace abounds. We've talked about this before. Um, and, and I want us to think of this as something we work toward. Like if you're in a marriage where there's sexual abuse as a part of your past or some type of trauma as a part of your past, you can't expect to just bloop, bloop, just jump right to this, what we're about to read. There's, there's some vulnerability. There's some trust that has to be built. There's some... Uh, some, some long-term loyalty and faithfulness that has to happen before you're ever ready for this. And so, men, if you married a woman who has a traumatic history like that, you, you're going to have to be extra open-handed and understanding of that when you leave here today. And we can't go home quoting the Bible to our wives, right, after today. Not this part of the Bible, at least. And ladies, uh, you can't expect your man to live up to Solomon either, because Solomon's about to, to t- say some things in a way that you have never experienced as a woman. You've never had a man express himself to you in this way before. Um, and so what we're about to see is, is pretty powerful. And it's, it's sacred. It's very, very holy. So he says this, <clears throat> verse 1 of chapter 4. Oh, you are beautiful, my darling. You are beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are like doves. Okay. Oh, you are beautiful is a very general compliment. But then he gets specific. Your eyes are like doves. What's he saying? So doves are a symbol of peace. Okay, so um, he's trying to say to her, like, when we're connected one-on-one, I feel at 
peace. Like I could be my total self. Uh, doves are monogamous birds. They're, they're monogamous in that they stay faithful to their mate until their mate dies. So it is like, it's a sign of fidelity and faithfulness. And he's saying, you, you when we are connected eyeball to eyeball, I, I feel fidelity from you. I know that it's just me and you. You're my ride or die, right? That's what he's saying. He's saying we're going to be faithful to each other until the end. But even bigger, the dove is a, is a symbolic of the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus was baptized in Matthew chapter 3, the clouds opened up. The Father said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. So when he's mentioning the dove here, he's mentioning that this is more than just us two having a physical interaction. That this thing is spiritual. That God is present in this. And every time that you have sex with your spouse, okay, married man and woman. Now, if you're single in the house today, you're not married, please give me some grace. This isn't necessarily a message for single people. It's something you get to look forward to. Um, and we could talk about singlehood because singleness is a gift for some of you and chastity is a gift for some of you. And we could talk about that, but not today. Today's not a sermon about that. Maybe one day we'll talk about that. But, but this is a man and a woman who are living within the context that God created marriage for. And he's, he's saying the presence of God is here. That this is more than just physical stimulation. This is deeper. This is a soul thing that's happening. He says, your hair is like a flock of female goats descending from Mount Gilead. Man, that's romantic, isn't it? <laughs> so both of them know what this looks like and what it feels like to see goats coming down the mountain. They're both sheep herders. So he's trying to describe like what he sees in a, in a way that connects to her heart. And so when she takes off her little bun or whatever she's got going on up here and she shakes out her hair, whoo, 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 and all this hair's falling down, he can't help but to think about how he feels when he sees all the goats coming down the mountain. That's all I got for you. I don't even know why else he would say that, okay? He goes on to say, your teeth, and this is important, girls, your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn sheep coming up from the washing place, okay? Thanks for brushing them, you know, thanks for washing your teeth. He says, each of them has a twin, and not one of them is missing. <laughs> so we know she's not a hockey player, right? So she's, she's got it together. Your lips are like a scarlet thread. Your mouth is lovely. Your forehead behind your veil is like a slice of pomegranate. So some translations use the word temples, and some say cheeks. They're, they don't really know Hebrew, the Hebraic sort of word, the Hebrew word. As it translates to English, is he talking about her temples, her cheeks, her forehead? Who knows? But what he's saying is that you've got some rosiness happening. It looks like a pomegranate. And they're going to use fruit often as they describe one another's bodies and physical features. They're also going to use fruit as they describe the experience they have together sexually. And they're going to talk about tasting things and delighting in things and all of this stuff, okay? And anytime you hear something and you go, does that mean what I think it means? Yes. Okay, so just so you know, as we read this together, it means what you think it means. So he says, your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stones. Like, girl, you got a neck of a linebacker. You know, like, is that what he's saying? Is that what he's saying? 1,000 shields are hung on it, all shields of valiant warriors. Okay, so he's looking at her jewelry hanging around her neck. She's probably well adorned. And he's saying, your neck is like a tower of David. So, so with you, I find safety. I feel like I can be vulnerable with you. You know, in this day, there really wasn't many places that the king could be vulnerable. He couldn't really let his guard down anywhere. And so to have a, a, an environment where the king could just be himself was a pretty big deal. And that's what he's saying to her. Like, with you, I just feel like I can be me, the most real version of me. And then he gets to her breast, verse 5, your two breasts. I like the way he points out that there's two of them. You, your two breasts are like fawns, twins of the gazelle, grazing among the lilies. Okay, now, now this is the point where you go, this is the Bible, this is the Bible. Fawns. Hey, when's the last time you saw two fawns? Like real, in real life, like woodland animal fawns. When's the last? What do you do when you see two little fawns out in the field? You stop. 
and you admire them. And you take it slow, right? You, you want to approach the fawns, right? All the t- everybody wants to go, go you want to pet them, right? You know, and you got to get a, you want to get close so you can see them closely. But you don't want to be too, don't, fawns! Like, don't do that because then the, the fawns will run away. You got to be gentle and be tender. Okay, that's what he's saying here. He's like, he, look, and some people, they translate this part of the Bible in such weird ways. All right? These really awkward, single, nerdy monk guys who translate the Bible, they have never had a girlfriend in their life, and so they try to come up with ways to interpret the Bible. They're like on a mountain somewhere wearing a robe, and they've shaved their head, and they've never seen a girl in their life. They don't know how to, to so they, some of these commentators will be like, the two fawns represent Moses and Aaron. It's the typology of two spiritual leaders, or the two fawns represent the Old Testament and the New Testament, where you're going to find the true milk of God's word. Or they, they come up with these weird commentary things, like it represents the blood and the water from Christ's side of this crucifixion. That is just like, that's the interpretation of a really frustrated monk, okay? Just so you know. Because <laughs> there isn't any spiritual implication to this. He's just complimenting her breasts. Like, he's pumped. He's like, when you go to the zoo... Where do they keep the baby fawns? In the petting section. So that's, all, that's literally all what he's saying here. So verse 6. <laughs> Until This is going to get more awkward for those of you who are already awkward, just so you know. Until the dawn arrives and the shadows flee. So that means all night long I will go up to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no blemish in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the crest of Amana, for the, from the top of Sinir, summit of Hermon. From the lion's dens and the mountain haunts of the leopards. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine. The fragrance of your perfume is better than any spice. So he's like, I really love how you smell. And he's, he's speaking to that, that scent that she gives off. And this, this is perfume. I, I, you know, when you walk into an apartment, you can very quickly tell if a woman lives there by the way it smells. If it smells like a burrito, dudes live here. If there's candles lit or potpourri or anything like that happening in the house, you could tell there's a female that has been in this place. And there's something delightful about the way she smells. Your lips drip sweetness like the honeycomb, my, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. So, so this is, okay, so this is probably 1,500 years before France ever existed. So this ain't a French kiss. This is a Hebrew kiss they're doing, okay? This is the real deal. And he says, uh, the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Verse 12, you are a locked garden, my sister, my bride. Wait a minute. Did he just call her his sister? Why would he do that? What's the significance of sister bride? Is she really a sister? No. This is a way of, of, of communicating a spiritual reality. That before you and I were ever married, you were my sister in Christ. That I see you as a sister before I see you as a bride. And when you see someone as your sister before you see them as a bride, you respect them deeply. That your your relationship isn't made up of purely physical intimacy. That there is a deeper soul tie happening here. And, And so before she's your wife, she's God's daughter, which makes her your sister in Christ. And it's important to know that. That you are, you are not a body with a soul. That you are a soul with a body. Your soul will live forever. Your body will die, will perish. And you are first a soul. And before you have physical arousal and physical intimacy, there is a soul thing happening here that is very sacred. And your marriage begins spiritually. Like the deepest, most profound part of you is not your body. It's not the physical, it's the spiritual. And when you have sex, you are, you are tying your soul together in spiritual ways that are very unique. 
And it's deeply spiritual, meaningful, and it's also important for you to know this, especially for those of you who aren't married um, or those of you who are married and thinking about having sex outside of the marriage, those of you who are divorced and just want to have sex with 38 people because, well, I've done it once with somebody, I might as well enjoy the rest of the world or whatever. Like whatever kind of things we're talking about, like here's what you need to know. And I don't want to make anybody feel guilty today because 99% of us in the room have gone somewhere sexually before we were married or, or in some way sexually sinned that we wouldn't want to advertise publicly. Okay, so I'm not going to pretend that that's not the truth. And I'm also going to tell you, I'm the chief of sinners up here on this stage. All right, so I'll be the first to admit that I, I'm not like some, some, I don't have some pure, I haven't got a lot of skeletons in my closet. Okay, so let's just be honest about it. Um, but the reason why premarital sex is something that no one would ever encourage from a pastoral perspective. Now, I know some of you are like, well, as long as it's two consensual people or I'm into non-monogamy or whatever things you have to say to make it th- feel very formal and stuff. Like, here's the thing. Like, when you have sex with someone, you were tying yourself up with them spiritually in a way. Now, some of you are married, but you had sex with a cu- couple people or more long before you were married. And you can remember the first one. You might not remember the seventh or the eleventh one, but you remember the first one. Because there's something that happened in that first one. And when you have sex with someone before you're married, here's what happens. You end up with a relationship that goes south real fast, and and it goes downhill real fast. Or you end up with a relationship that drags out way longer than it should have. Because when you're having sex, it ties you you spiritually. And, And when you know you need to break up, it's hard to break up because you've already had sex, and now you're emotionally and spiritually attached to this person who you know isn't actually following in the same footsteps that you would want them to. All right. So it's important to know that sex is highly spiritual, that God made it with a purpose, for purpose and on purpose. He, and he did it, he gave it to us as a gift, and he gave it to us with boundaries. And so what we're reading about here in, in these boundaries is an ideal picture of a married couple engaging intimately in sex. He says to her, you are an enclosed spring. A sealed up fountain. So he says these two things. You're a locked garden, my sister, my bride. You're an enclosed spring. I love that. It's like you are a locked garden, not a public park. You are an enclosed spring, not a public swimming pool. And here's the reality. If marriage is like a garden, then that means that marriage is something that we have to tend to like a garden. And if your marriage is a garden... You have to be intentional to keep the weeds out, to keep the foxes out, and to put the right nutrients in the garden to cause the fruit to grow. And if your garden sucks, it's partly your fault because you're not tending that garden. And marriage takes work. And, and great sex takes work. You have to be intentional and, and, and thoughtful. And so your marriage is not a public pool either. You're, there are some of us, we are way too public about our marriage in our small groups and on Facebook and everywhere else we can be public. It's like there, there's some, you got to protect your privacy. There are some things about your spouse that your spouse's friends don't need to know. And so how are you tending that locked garden? Privacy is different from secrecy. Secrecy is we're doing some things that we maybe don't want people to know because we know we shouldn't be doing these things. That's different. Privacy is we've got some things going on because we're married, and I know some things, and they know some things about me, but that's none of y'all's business, right? And it's okay to have some, some privacy together where you're saying, we're, we're engaging, we're taking care of our garden, we're tending one another's gardens. Verse 13, your shoots are a royal garden full of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna and nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with every kind of spice. Myrrh and aloes with all the finest spices. You are a garden spring, a well of fresh water flowing down from Lebanon. So this is great. So they're, they're, they're consummating their marriage. Covenant and consummation is happening right here before our eyes. So the beloved says to her lover, Awake, O north wind. Come, O south wind. Blow on my garden. It's exactly what you think it's saying. Yes. So that its fragrant spices may send out their sweet smell. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its delightful fruit. Yes. 
That's exactly what it sounds like. V chapter 5, verse 1. I have entered my I have entered my garden. Oh, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my balsam spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. So you see they're engaging in this, and there's a lot of metaphor here. There's a lot of eating and drinking and enjoying and delighting and all this stuff. Sometimes people ask, well, you know, this happens a lot, especially with young people before they're married. They want to know, how far is too far? You know, like before I can, before, how, how far, what's the line before I get married? But then you'd be surprised, young people, because after people get married, then they want to know, well, how too far can I go? You know, like how, <laughs> what can we do now that we're married? Like what things can we do? And there's some, a lot of questions about that. Like, like what in a healthy marriage relationship, what types of things can you enjoy with one another sexually? What are our boundaries? People ask these questions a lot because it's, a, it's very relevant uh, to marriage. And so I found myself in positions where I have to help people navigate, like what kind of creativity can you exercise within the context of your marriage bed. The scriptures say in Hebrews 4 that the marriage bed is undefiled. There's not a single verse in the scriptures that prohibit you from being creative in the bedroom with your spouse. God gives us a lot of boundaries for sex in terms of who we can do it with, but he doesn't give us a ton of boundaries for what happens within a marriage between a man and a woman. And so when it comes to creativity in the bedroom, as well, I often tell people, you want to ask a couple of questions. One, does the Bible say anything about this thing that we want to do, whatever you're thinking about? Okay. Does the scripture say this is off limits? And you really want to ask that question. You know, like, is, is, what about porn? Can we watch porn together? Well, what would the scripture say about that? When the scriptures talk about sexual immorality and adultery, the answer would be clearly no. Oh, can we bring a third person into the bedroom? If both of us agree, can we add a third person or more than three people? And the answer would be no, scripturally, no. The closest thing to a third person that you can have in your bedroom is this girl named Alexa. And you say, Alexa, play 90s R&B music. <laughs> it's the closest thing to a third person, okay? So, so, so who else can you add to the marriage room? Keith Sweat. Nobody, baby. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Some of y'all grew up in the 90s. You just, you, 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 it's, marriage is for a man and for a woman. And sex is for one man and one woman within the context of marriage. It says in Hebrews 13, 4, that marriage must be honored among all. And the marriage bed kept undefiled. For God will judge sexually immoral people and adulterers. So, so that's your first question as a Christian married couple. Second question you want to ask is, does this violate my conscience? Is there something about what we're wanting to do that violates mine or his or her conscience? This is a very important question to ask. And if, if you want to do something that violates your spouse's conscience, great sex happens when the two people serve one another, not come to take. You came to be a giver, not a taker. And so if you're expecting something that they're not comfortable with and violates their conscience, you better lay that thing down and sacrifice it. And if you treat them in a way that makes them feel used afterwards, because like a, in a lot of situations, like, the guy just wants to be finished so he can keep watching ESPN. And she's going, what was that? And if you're just a taker, then you're in an abusive relationship. If that's all you've come to do is take. And so if it violates either of your conscience, right? Like she doesn't, she doesn't need to be trying to fulfill all the fantasies you have after your 30-year porn history. Right? No, you should check yourself and go, wait a minute. There's some things I need to lay down here and recognize. And be very comfortable accepting that perhaps I've stepped across the line. And now I need to own that, confess it to my spouse, and repent of it. Which means change my mind about it, and that will help me change my behavior about it. So does it violate one of your conscience? Then I, wouldn't, I would say no, don't do that. And then the last thing is, does it violate your body or her body? Like, does it hurt? Is it safe? These are legitimate questions that you need to be asking because some of y'all are in some weird stuff. Very rarely am I, am I at a loss for words. So let's move on from that. So uh, <laughs> after, after this happens, after it says that, that we're going to enjoy each other's fruit and we're going to come delight together and blow on my guard and rise north wind and all this stuff, 
There's a, a verse in chapter 6, verse 13, or, or chapter at the end of the, uh, chapter 4, or beginning of chapter 5. There's some conflict around where this verse lands. But, but it's, it's the presence of someone else speaking. It was written in as an additional person speaking. And the questions are, like, is it him speaking to her, her speaking to him? Is it their friends talking to them? Or, and most commentators would argue, that this is supposed to be God speaking to the couple. And God shows up and says, eat, friends, and drink. Drink freely, O lovers. God speaks. And, and where there is a sacred union between a man and a woman who are functioning sexually the way God would have them, God breathes life on that. He says, eat, drink, and enjoy. He's not surprised by sex. He made it on purpose. And he's not ashamed or embarrassed by it the way many of us are. And the most beautiful thing that we see here is a man and woman who are naked and unashamed and enjoying each other's company the way Adam and Eve would have done in the garden. And that's what ultimately marriage is supposed to accomplish. So it says in verse 13 of chapter 6, when we move past the big argument and they're having sex again, uh, it says, turn, turn, O perfect one. Turn, turn, that I may stare at you. Why do you gaze upon the perfect one like the dance of Mahainaim? So I look at that and I was like, what is the dance of Mahainaim? The dance of Mahainaim is an ancient way of dancing and simultaneously taking your clothes off while you're dancing. And she is doing this dance for him and with him. Why? Because they're in a loving, caring, vulnerably safe, honest, transparent relationship. And, and he has been very generous with his words and very thoughtful with the culture that he's created. And he's tending the garden in a way that makes her feel loved, that she is absolutely adored by him, that she's the, the only one in his eyes, that he's only got eyes for her. And because he creates that place of safety, she responds by being visually generous toward him. And this is a natural, normal thing to see in a marriage. So this dance is way more than like a viral TikTok dance, okay? This is something that's private, not public. And they don't, they don't have a, a, you know, an intention of anyone else being involved in this. And he says... To her, as she's dancing, all right, get this, she's doing the, the, the dance, what, whatever that is. He's telling her, turn around, like, stop teasing me, look over here, turn around, I want to see you, and all this stuff. I have no clue what's going on with the dance, but I found this interesting, because he compliments her feet. <laughs> How beautiful are your sandaled feet, O no woman's daughter. All right, so remember in chapter 4, he started up here and started working his way down, but he never got to the equator. He like, he ended, all right. Now they're making love again, and he's going to start from her feet, and now he's going to work his way up to her head, describing her. He starts with her feet, and feet aren't pretty, especially 3,000-year-old feet in this day. You ever seen those Jesus movies? They're like walking around in all this ocean, I mean, all this sand with no ocean. Like they, There's like all this gunk between their toes. I mean, feet are not pretty. And feet would be something she would be insecure about, just like she's insecure about potentially her nose, She's probably insecure. She said earlier she's insecure about her farmer's tan. And he is going to compliment the very thing that she might be the most insecure about. There is something really powerful, guys. I have never met a girl who's not insecure about something physically. Never. Every woman is to some degree. Okay? All the, all the white girls want to be darker. All the dark girls want to be lighter. All the blonde girls want brown hair. All the brown-haired girls want blonde hair. And there's always a way to improve. And I know it's not because you're insecure. It's just that those things make you more secure. It's not about insecurity. It's about more security. I understand how this works. So, so like, uh, when a man can look at her and say, hey, I know this one thing about you that you are most concerned about. But let me just tell you how perfect it is. Now, is he telling her that she is perfect? That's exactly what he's telling her. But do you think she's really perfect? She's not. She doesn't fit the cultural standard of beauty. It's crazy. It's crazy how the cultural standards of beauty are so impossible to reach, and everyone's trying to reach it. 
And all of our insecurity de is derived from our inability to reach that standard. And when a man can look at his woman and let her know that you are perfect for me, that you are my standard of beauty, that when I married you, God didn't give me a type, he gave me a wife, and that you are everything to me. And all the things that you're concerned about, all the little things that you're insecure about, you, you need to know this, ladies, the very thing that you might be most insecure about might be the thing he likes the most about you. That might be the thing that draws him to you, that he adores about you. And so you have all these concerns, and, and this man is saying, no, 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 you, you are perfect. You're, the curves of your thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a master craftsman. Try saying that tonight, guys. That's a good one. He's saying to her, you are a masterpiece. Ephesians chapter 2 says, you are God's workmanship. Okay. Maybe he's quoting his father, David, who wrote in Psalm 139 that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And he's speaking life to this girl. He says in verse 2, your navel is a round mixing bowl, and may it never lack mixed wine. Your belly is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Okay, you don't want to do that one, guys. The mound of wheat one doesn't work. But what's he saying? Ultimately, what he's saying is this. All right, he, he talks about wine and wheat, wine and wheat. So in, in, the, in this day, there were two big festivals they would celebrate throughout the year. There's a lot of different festivals. Most of our uh, religious history is made up of various festivals. But he mentions wine and wheat. So there's a, there's a spring festival called the Wine Festival. It's a celebration of wine. And the reason why they did this festival was to ultimately say to God, thank you for giving us wine. They saw wine as a gift. And they knew that God, that you didn't need wine. It was just a gift from God. And you don't have to drink it, but it's a gift from God. It's sort of almost uh, like God gives you everything you want. Okay? Wheat, though, is a need. And they would have in the fall the wheat festival. And at the wheat festival, they would thank God for providing all of our needs. Okay? Because that's bread and that's resource and that's money stuff. And so in essence, what he's saying to her is that you are everything that I want and everything that I need. That my eyes and my heart is only for you. How many of you ladies have a husband that makes you feel that way? You don't have to raise your hand. But he, does he make you feel like he, you are everything that he wants and needs? Guys, how do you make her feel that way? I can tell you how to breach that. When, when she catches you looking at things on your computer or she sees stuff on your phone or uh, she knows that when y'all go out to eat, sometimes it's not that you're, look, you're not just looking at TV, but you're looking at other girls and you got other interests, and she feels like your eyes aren't only for her, she'll start to really question, am I everything he needs? Am I everything he wants? And when a woman starts to begin to question that about herself with her man, she will also begin to simultaneously devalue herself. And then if you want to have this kind of a relationship, you have to cultivate that garden so that she believes that that's what you, and that that's truth about you, that she is everything you want and everything you need. Now, here when he says your navel is a round mixing bowl, um, there's, a, there's a, I have an app that uh, helps me sometimes contextualize things, and it's, this is what it says. It's talking about this Hebrew word navel, and I found it interesting. The noun shorer, which is a Hebrew word, is a hapax legomon. I don't know what that means. Appearing in the Old Testament only here. And there is debate whether it means navel or vulva. Which makes sense, because he started at her feet. Now he's describing her thighs. He goes up her thighs. Like, this ain't no head, shoulders, knees, and toes stuff. He's talking about more than the knees and the toes, you know. And he just rises. And then he talks about this thing being filled with mixed wine, right? Any person with a navel that has stuff coming out of it, like mixed wine, they need to go see a doctor, right? So clearly, he's, he's talking about that mixed wine. And then what do you do with wine? You drink it. This is marriage. This is the way God designed it. Praise the Lord. Okay, so chapter, verse 3. He goes on to repeat the same thing he said earlier. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twin, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like a tower made of ivory. Your eyes are the pools in Heshbon by the gate of Baphrabim. What's he saying about her eyes? This is amazing, guys. Because sometimes you can get so carried away with her body and that you're just thinking about what you're going to get pleasure out of the deal, 
But what he's saying to her is so much more than that. He's like, your eyes are like the pools of Heshbon. Like these were, these were amazing sights to see in Hebrew culture. That these were such beautiful springs that people would travel from far away just to see these things. Because they're gorgeous. And what he's saying to her is like, he's the king, right? He's got things to do. He's busy. He's probably got a lot of phone calls to do. He's got a lot of work to do from home. And he's got to go help people. He deals with armies and soldiers. And he's got a lot going on. But man, when he can just escape all of what he's got going on. And he could just be with her and look into her eyes. He gets lost there. And he doesn't want to be anywhere else. And she's not questioning whether he wants to be anywhere else. And men and women, we need in our marriages, we have a lot of shoulder-to-shoulder time. Where we're both getting after it. And we're doing life. We're paying the bills and we're working and we're taking care of the kids. And we've got a lot going on. Errands to run. All that stuff. Shoulder-to-shoulder time. And we're good teammates. We're good partners in that. But we need more face-to-face time. You need more eyeball-to-eyeball time. You need to get lost in one another's eyes. He says, your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon overlooking Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. The locks of your hair are like royal tapestries. The king is held captive in its tresses. He's like, the most, the most amazing thing about me isn't my crown. You are my crown. I don't find my value and security in being the king in my job or in my success or in my hobbies or my friends, baby. You are my crown. Some of you guys can, can feel me on this. Sometimes I think to myself, man, my wife is my crown. I am so proud of her. Have you ever felt that way? Like, I'm just proud to be with her. People come to me and they're like, man, how did an idiot like you end up with a girl like her? And I'm, I think that's a compliment, you know? Like Wes right here, if I, if I told Wes, if I just came up to Wes one day, Sitting right here in the third, fourth row, right back in the middle. You can raise your hand if you want, Wes. And I was like, you know what? You are one big old hairy goofball, you big old idiot. He would be like, say it in my face, fool. He would take me down because I promised that dude could take me. Maybe, probably. So, uh, but if I came to Wes and I was like, bro, how did a big old goofy looking dumb idiot like you end up with a beautiful girl like Joy? He'd be like, hey, I know I'm kind of dumb, ain't I? Because there's just something different about that, right? Whenever you talk about a man and then you talk about his wife in a way that's honoring and you lift her up, you could tear him down all you want. But if you're lifting her up, you're lifting him up, right? This is the way he feels. He's like, she is my everything. She's my crown. How beautiful you are. How lovely, O oh love, with your delights. Your statue is like a palm tree and your breasts are like clusters of grapes. I want to climb the palm tree and take a hold of its fruit stalks. Some of you ladies are like, why is he always trying to touch me? Like in the kitchen and stuff. Why is he always doing that? He's just trying to be biblical. Like it's in the Bible. (laughs) Some guy, yes. So what's the spiritual implication of this? Nothing. There is none. It's just plain old, honest, authentic. This is how it is. And He says, may may your breasts be like the cluster of grapes, and may the fragrance of your breath be like apricots. May your mouth be like the best wine flowing smoothly for my beloved, gliding gently over our lips as we sleep together. And then she says, I am my beloved's, and he desires me. And that word desire, it means consume. He, He wants me. And there is no better feeling than that, that I am his and he is mine. That you are one another's. And in marriage, this is the goal that we look toward. These can't be rules that we live by because we're all at different places. And we got to work. And for some of you, this can take years to get to this place where you feel that comfortable and that safe with one another. But, but men, be verbally generous with her. Like, and I'm not talking about just saying pickup lines so you can get sex. I'm talking about being, find ways to articulate how you feel about her. So she knows who she is in your eyes. Find ways to create and cultivate a place in your home and in your life where she feels safe and can be vulnerable and she feels protected and not ashamed. And you, you want to create that for her. And ladies, you want to do the same for him. Be visually generous toward him. Like, understand that he's motivated by different things than you're motivated by. And the call of both of us in this relationship is to be selfless and to serve one another. 
that we lay down our lives for each other. And so she feels valued, and he feels valued. And some of you go, man, I wish I had that in my marriage. Well, why can't I get a girl like that? And they're like, well, that's why, because <laughs> of what you just said. Um, here's the thing. Here's what I'm inspired to do. Women. We'll start with the ladies. Up your game. Men, up your game. Like if you want this in your marriage, it is available to you. But you got to do the garden work and you got to do the hard work. You know, ladies, like when did when did you become so crabby? You know what I mean? Where it's like nothing ever goes right. You're just always crabby about something. Yeah. You know, he's trying to touch upon you and you're just like, quit killing me. Kids are kids are upstairs or something like that. You're like, they're asleep. They've been asleep for two hours, you know. Come to bed in something that's like, you know, dress for the job that you want. You know what I mean? Like, like you come, come to bed in like a snowsuit and some flannel. It's like, ask yourself the question, like, when did I stop, when did I stop being spontaneous? Why did I stop being, why? I used to laugh at all his jokes and like really adore him and respect them. And now I just, I'm always talking junk or jabbing or got something to say or there's always something going on. Like it. For you to up your game is going to be, it's going to require intentionality around how you control your mind. Because sometimes you don't guard your mind, and your mind makes you spit out words that ultimately make him go, well, dang, I'm a nobody. And the more that he gets rejected in this area, now I'm not saying that there's, that you should always, this isn't a rule to live by where you should always be like ready to do the dance of my nine. Like, most men is going to get that dance once or twice in their entire life, okay? So just so you know, just if you've gotten more than two, then you're a blessed man, okay? So just so you know. But, but here's the, the thing. Ask yourself, what, what do I need to do to, to work toward this? And men, like, when did you stop wearing clothes that matched? You know, like, when, try a little harder. You know what I'm saying? Like, wake up and put, like, make a plan. When did you stop being creative? Remember you used to go on, like, dates with a theme? And you would write little love notes and, like, leave them places? Or, like, what, what was it that you used to do that you stopped doing that if you started doing again, it would lead to the same types of things that used to happen? Like, what, have, have you gotten lazy, guys? Like, this is a question we should all be asking ourselves. What, physical laziness? We just rather just come home and drink all day? Like, what are the things where you go, you know what, I need to own this and recognize that I have a responsibility here. And I have to be intentional with my wife. I don't just check out all day and then show up and expect to make love. Before bed? No, because great sex starts in the kitchen. Foreplay starts in the morning, like caring for the kids and getting them ready for school, like being engaged in the life of the family, stuff like that. What things did you used to do that, that she would go, yeah, those are the days whenever I felt these feelings with you. And maybe there's something the two of you talk about. Just lay it out before each other and say, what, what areas of our garden can we tend to to create this type of of love life and let's just say that's homework because I'm done preaching time's up and uh, we didn't even get through all of chapter 7 so lucky you because it just keeps getting more awkward so uh, let's pray together and I, I want to take a moment and just pray a blessing over our marriages and for those who are planning to be married uh, and also again just for the sake of clarity and to remind you that this is a descriptive text not a prescriptive and I and certainly in no, in no way believe that a woman should be objectified in some way, whether in marriage or outside. Um, so any of those vibes that you got today, um, in a healthy, intimate, loving, safe relationship, you feel comfortable with those things, being visually generous and verbally generous toward one another. So, so Father, we love you and thank you for your word to us, and we pray that we would be people who desire this type of intimacy within our marriages. Lord, for our married couples, I just pray for a greater uh, um, uh, intimacy, a, a, a new, Lord, that we would begin to do things we've never done in order to have the marriage we've never had. I pray that we'd be willing to acknowledge changes that we need to make in order to, to create this kind of a garden. And, and Father, for our single folks who um, feel somehow that something's being withheld from them or something like that. I just pray for your Holy Spirit's power and courage to uh, give them confidence as they walk in faithfulness with you, uh, waiting for the time 
that they can enjoy these types of things as well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. I hope you have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday.